the book of Acts chapter 2 verses number 38 to 42 and I read then Peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. This morning, I'm going to be speaking to you on these verses that I've read. From these verses, you can see that a Christian is one who comes to Christ as a sinner and receives a new life in Christ Jesus. There is nobody that has been born as a Christian. We're all in darkness. And then, Jesus came to us and we were translated into his motherless light. So a Christian is not a man who receives Christ as his Lord and Savior and then goes back to his previous life. A Christian is not a man who walks down to the altar and repeats some words and says, even with his mouth, Jesus come into my heart and then goes back to his previous life. That is not a Christian. Those words that were repeated even at the altar, they were just empty words. To prove that those words were really serious from the bottom of his heart, when a Christian repeats, when a man repeats those words, he never goes back to his former life. He is a new creation. This is the proof. This is Christianity. A Christian is a man who makes a decision to follow Christ and then he follows with that decision. He goes on with that decision into a new life in Christ Jesus. He has received a new life in Christ Jesus and he has to live out this new life in this world. No matter the cost. That is the definition of a Christian. No excuse. Oh, this is happening. They didn't do this for me, therefore I'm going back. That is not a Christian. A Christian is a new creation. The old life is passed away. It's gone. The old man has been crucified with Christ. All those bridges they have been born is forward forever. He needs that new life in Christ Jesus in this world no matter how difficult it is. If I perish, I perish in Christ Jesus. That is a Christian. A Christian is not a man that says I lost my salvation. 
He does not lose his salvation. He said he will die. He's a new creation. A human being can never be a goat. No matter what he suffers. No matter what he goes through. He can never be a goat. Instead he will die as a human being. The child of God is a man that has made a decision for Christ and he lives in Christ in this world till the end. Shall we put our hands together for the Holy Spirit? We all need this new life. Sooner or later, all of us will die. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. As a medical doctor I have seen people of all ages die. I've seen babies in their mother's womb they die. I've seen babies they were just born some cried, some did not cry, and they died. Babies of one year, two years, I've seen people of all ages, middle age, 50 years old men, 60, 70, 80, 90, I've seen them die. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. The world needs to hear this Christian message. The first believers in this book of Acts showed their new life in certain ways. It was clear. It was clear that they had a new life. The Christian is a new creation. He can never go back. The old man has been crucified with Christ. The old man is dead. Romans chapter 6. He can never go back. It was this argument, this discussion Jesus had with Nicodemus. When Nicodemus said, you must be born again. You must of necessity be born again to be a new creation. And Nicodemus said, shall a man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Don't you see how ridiculous it is? How preposterous it is? Can you, as you sit down there, go into your mother's womb and be born again? If you are... These Christians in this book of Acts they left the world and joined themselves to the apostles and the company of 120 believers on that day of Pentecost and the apostle Peter was preaching to them the 3,000 who were in darkness who made that decision to follow Christ they joined themselves to the apostles and the company of 120 believers. In other words, they became members of the Christian church. They joined the church. They joined the body of Christ. After they received the word. They were baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. And then they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. They therefore became members of the Christian church. They became members of the body of Christ. Now, the next question that we must consider is this. What did they 
come together for. They joined the 120 disciples and became the member of the body of Christ. So the question I'm asking is this, what did they come together for? Why? They, came, they all came together. They joined the 120, 3,120. They joined them. They joined themselves to these people. To do what? For what? Here were these people who had come out of the world to join the group of people called disciples. And they formed the first church. The question again is, what is the Christian church for? What is this gathering here for? Why did they gather together? What was the purpose of the gathering? Join what? To do what? They would have just received Christ and everybody go, goes back to his own house. But they did it. They joined the 120 disciples. They came together. For what? Why did the Holy Spirit baptize them into one body? The church called the body of Christ. What is the Christian church for? What is this gathering for? Why do we gather here every Sunday? What does the church do? Why do we gather in the church? Praise the name of the Lord. Do Christian people come together so that they can gather money solely for the pastor's use? Is this the reason why we gather here? So that we can take offering for, for the pastor and his wife and his family? Is that the purpose? Why these people gathered? Why they joined themselves? You see, what I'm trying to do, I'm not trying to criticize anybody. I'm trying to hold before you the church in the New Testament. So that you can see what the church is. So that we can be conformed to that first century church. What was the purpose? Is the purpose just to raise money? Is the purpose just for me to come here and say, $1,000 here, $5,000 here, please come out and give. And I do that every Sunday. Is that the purpose? Do they come together for socials? Is this like worry club? Or do they come for lectures on politics? Is this a political ground where we debate on politics? Is this the place where we talk about the Fulani herdsmen? Is this the place where we talk about, I mean, uh, PDP or APC or HIV? Or is this the place where men are taught on how to get rich? Lectures on sociology lectures on how to buy shares is this the place for that is this why we are gathering is this the purpose of the church as I said it is not my design to denounce these things but I do want to show you how far away the church in Nigeria has strayed away from the New Testament church. And many of us don't even know it. When you see all of these fake things happening in the church, this, the church in Nigeria, some years ago, it was the struggle of almost every pastor, every man of God 
to do miracles. Then they started faking miracles. Then everybody knew that they were faking miracles. Now they moved to another level, level of prophecy. Now they are faking miracles. And the people are beginning to know now oh, that they are faking these miracles. How they arrange it, how they set it up, and how they bring it to the church to deceive the people of God. Is that the reason why we are gathering here? You see, the Christian church, the Nigerian church, especially the evangelical church, they make a fool of themselves when she attempts to teach things that she's not called to do. You see, it's a pity when you see a pastor who is a carpenter. There's nothing wrong in being a carpenter our Lord himself was a carpenter. When a pastor who, who is a carpenter, a pastor who is a mechanic, there's nothing wrong in any, a mechanic being a pastor. But listen to what I'm saying. When a pastor who is a, a carpenter and he is standing on the altar of God and is teaching the people how to buy shares. Is teaching the people how to do business, how to succeed in business. Is teaching them how to register companies. And in the congregation of these people that is teaching, there are men who have PhD in business, PhD in economics. They are sitting down there. Masters. Many of you have masters. Many of you have bachelor's degrees. Many of you know these things more than me. And I'm standing here and I'm teaching you economics. Don't you see how the Nigerian church is making a fool of itself? I'm a medical doctor by profession, but I don't even come here to tell you any of those stuff. Because that's not what the gathering is for. The church is not gathered for any of them. any of these things. Anybody, if anybody wants any teaching with regards to these worldly things, they can go and get them professionally. You, there are schools. There are courses. Crash courses. You can go and take them. Courses in economics, three months, six months. You can go to, to these professional schools. But it is embarrassing when you find pastors doing teaching what they are not supposed to teach. It is not a sin to go to school and study the sciences. It is not. I am not denouncing any church in particular. But I just want to hold before you the picture of the New Testament church. They did not gather to do any of these things. This New Testament church in the book of Acts chapter 2, after the people received the word, they were baptized. 3,000 of them, they were baptized. Verse 40, look at verse 40, what it says. It said, and they continued And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, I want you to have this picture. This is the apostle Peter evangelizing these people. And they made the decision for Christ. And then they joined the apostles. They joined the disciples. And when they joined the disciples, what happened? Apostle Peter did not start telling them, well, there are some of you here who have just come and uh, the Lord is saying that 10 of you uh, will give so, so, so. Uh, uh, 20 of you will give so, so, so. Because there are 3,000. Wow, that's a lot of people. 
He said, they continued. And they continued. Steadfastly. In other words, the word continue, the apostle Peter was preaching to them. Like the apostle Peter said, when I came to you, I determined not to know anything about you except Christ and him crucified. Now, he has presented Christ and him crucified to these people and they came out to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. What happened? He continued in that preaching. He continued in all that that he was telling them about the cross, about what Jesus did in the cross. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. It was purely spiritual activities. And that is the pattern that is laid down for the church at all times. The apostles doctrine. There is what you call the apostles doctrine or teaching. You can see this is put first in the list. It is very important that we start with this because there is a real opposition to what we have read here. There are some people who are opposing this. Like what I'm doing to you now, there is an opposition to it. That we must not continue in the apostles' doctrine, but instead we should do other things. You know, perhaps because the people are poor. In those days they were poor. They were poorer than us. Those 3,000, those were farmers. They were poor. They didn't, have the, they didn't have food to eat. They were poor people. They lived in touched houses. It's not the type of houses that we are living today. The, the apostles, they knew that these people were poor. What shall it profit a man? If he lives in a palace and then loses his soul. What shall he profit a man if he has the whole world and then he loses his soul? But then look at it. You don't even have the whole world. You don't have it. You don't even have a house. Is it not wise for you to know? Are you not seeing it? That even the men that have the old world, it is appointed unto them once to die. And after that, the judgment. What shall it profit a man? If he gains all of this. So the apostles, they were not concerned with the fact, let me put it this way, they were not concerned with the fad because there's what you call the doctrine of first in first they understand that these men were poor but there is something more important than that there is always something more important than that and this is their soul we understand you don't have food to eat you don't have house to say but you are living and you need to be saved That is the teaching. It is for this reason that they continued steadfastly in the doctrine, in the apostles' doctrine. They would have said, well, uh, these men are poor. These 3,000 men, they are poor. You can see it as you read the book of Acts. That at the time, they, 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 each one gave and all that. They were sharing food. One to themselves, this gave and all that they were sharing. The apostles would have just said, well, because these men are poor, so now we have to teach you on how to make money. If the Nigerian church were actually teaching the people on how to make money, that would have still been understandable. But the truth is that they were not teaching them on how to make money, but they were extorting them 
and at the same time giving them the impression that they were teaching them on how to make money. There's nothing like that in the school of economics. The apostles would have done that. But they did not do that because there was something that was more important than even their poverty. The state of their soul. It was for this reason that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine every single day. Now the next question is why did they want this doctrine? The apostle Peter later wrote he later wrote a letter to a number of Christians and this is what he said to them in 1 Peter 2.2 2, he said as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby in other words one thing to listen to the word of God is inevitable if men and women are born again. The sign that a man or a woman is born again is that he has a strong desire to listen to the word of God. He wants to hear the word of God. A baby does not understand how milk is made or where it comes from. But he has an instinct for milk. The child of God has an instinct to hear, to listen to the word of God. Of course, this is the proof that he is a child of God. And that is a baby in Christ. He wants to know the child is alive and wants the mother's milk. Every child wants the mother's milk. Every child wants milk. Every child of God wants to hear the word of God. A man cannot be a Christian and have no desire for the knowledge of the word of God. The word of God is the bread of life. I want to know the word of God. What would have happened if I didn't hear the word of God? What would have happened if I didn't go to that crusade? What would have happened if I didn't meet this man? What would have happened if I didn't know? You mean I would have gone to hell? Please tell me more about this. It was for this reason that Jesus said to Peter in John 21, 15, he said, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than this? What is this? Lovest thou me more than this your business? More than this your desire to be pregnant? More than this your desire to have children? More than this your desire to marry? Lovest thou me more than this? And Peter said to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, Feed my lambs, feed them with the word of God. Do you love me, Peter? Tell them, preach to them the word of God. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs with the word of God, with the bread of life. He didn't say to them, extort my lamb, nor fleece my lamb. You know, there are some pastors who come to meet me and, and they say, well, pastor, we have, been, we have been in this ministry for many years and nothing. I say, so, I say, so what do you mean by nothing? What they mean is this. I've been in ministry, I've been preaching for years, and uh, uh, we have not made it. Hoping maybe there's a secret that I have. 
Or maybe I'll take them to one native doctor somewhere. Now this man, I did one for me. What do you want to know? That's what the Lord is saying. Feed my sheep. Jesus was the savior, the mentor of Peter. Feed my sheep. Preach the word of God. The apostles' doctrine. Feed them, not extort them. Father, why did they want more and more of this teaching? These 3,000 men, why did they want to hear? Another answer is that they had become aware of their ignorance. These were people who had shouted some few days ago, away with him, crucify him. They had taught they knew everything about this Galilee. They thought they knew him that this man is fake. This small boy, 33 years old, that was given birth in our presence, just rose up. He says he's the son of God. He says he's God. Away with him. Who is he to claim to be the son of the living God and the savior of the world? They had thought they were clever. They had thought they knew everything. Just as people think they are clever. When they deny and make fun of the message of the Christian church, there are some people, you find them all over the social media. They give the impression that they are philosophers. They give the impression that they have come to a position now that they know. They have discovered the secret that there is no God. That this Jesus is fake. Now this is you. This is this small boy. A small boy in his mother's womb that was unconscious in his mother's womb. That knew nothing. That was delivered. In one crooked hospital, sometimes at home. You know, for example, I was delivered at home 70 years ago. There were a few hospitals. Most people of my age were delivered at home. Of course, the infantile mortality rate was high. But thank God that I survived it. Even if you were delivered in UBTH. Even if you were delivered in UBTH. Or any of the teaching hospitals. You could still die. There are children who are delivered in Mayo Clinic in the United States and they still die. You are unconscious. There's nothing you could have done. You are at the mercy of the doctors, mercy of the nurses, or mercy of, of, your, of your mom. There are moms who deliver children and kill the very children that they delivered. There are mothers like that. But here am I. Survived all the different diseases. Measles and all of them. All the different diseases. Chicken pox smallpox, all the different plagues and all that. I survived it. You survived it. Look at you. you are. Then one day, you rose up and then you start saying, there is no God. What does the Bible call a man like that? Akpa. This is what you call an ungrateful man. He has forgotten. There is no God. And look at you today. Look at how you were delivered. And look at you. <clears throat> These are people who think that they are smarter. They are smarter than God. But suddenly, these same people, they were awakened. 
they were pricked in their hearts. When they had Peter preaching, these same people who were ignorant, they were convicted. And what they discovered was their ignorance. They discovered, all of us, we came to this position. After we received Christ, we came to this position in which we discovered our ignorance. Yeah, I was a fool. I was a fool. There was a time in which I too, standing here now and speaking these glorious words unto you, there was a time too, I myself, I said that there is no God. You know, there are some people who convince themselves that by convincing themselves that there is no God, then they think that they have convinced the whole world. Fools. You see, we come to that position in which we thank God. Hey, I was a fool. I was a fool. All that time I was arguing with Christians. There is no God. I beg, make the Jesus go. These same people, they came to the position in which they discovered their ignorance. They had been blind, but suddenly their eyes were open. You see, you cannot be a Christian without being made humble in this manner. You must come to a position in which you will discover that you were a fool. Jesus said in Matthew 18.3 Except ye be converted and become as little children ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. We must all come to this position where we discover that we were foolish and we were ignorant. And the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.18, he said, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. The gospel convicts us of ignorance. And it is only those who know they are ignorant and thirst and hunger for the word of God. These are the people that are Christians. Do you know that these people you talk to every day? The people in your office, the people in your compound, do you know that they are ignorant about the word of God? They are ignorant. Certainly, the world is ignorant because if they know it, in one day, everybody will come to Jesus. But they are ignorant. Are you capitalizing on this ignorance? I'm speaking to you now who are pastors. Because I know that many of you here will be pastors. Are there pastors here? Make some noise, pastors. Yes. Many of you here will be pastors. So I'm speaking to you, pastors. Are you capitalizing on the ignorance of these people to extort them or teach them something else? You see, that's what the pastors in the Nigerian church, that, that's what they are doing. If you go to these churches, many times they are filled up with women, silly women, and they know they are ignorant, even men. Illiterate men. They are filled up with these men, and they capitalize on their ignorance. All of these fake prophecies, many of you, you know they are fake, that you see on video in all of these churches and you are wondering how come these people believe this type of thing how come because you are seeing it and you are seeing that this thing is arranged but the people don't believe and, but the people don't believe that the pastor is fake and even when the pastor is arrested by police 
the people still gather and say, the pastor is, is the right man. Why are you laughing now? <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. <laughs> the people are saying, no, no, they hate him. They set them up. They set them up. No, be, it's not really a fake man. Have you yourself realized your ignorance? Or is this a question of the blind leading the blind? Pastor is ignorant. The congregation is ignorant. Pastor is blind. The congregation is blind. The people wanted to understand more and more about the tremendous thing that has happened to them. They wanted to know. The natural question to ask is this, is this what is this what has happened to me what has happened to them why did they join the apostles they were newborn babes and they wanted to understand they wanted an explanation they wanted to know what really happened how did this happen so you mean this type of thing is this type of thing exists so you mean somebody can be born again and look I'm 40 you mean I would have escaped it you mean the rapture would have come and I would have escaped it yay please tell me more I don't want to escape anything again I want to know everything about this Jesus I want to set myself on the line I want to obey his word I don't want to miss anything this is the desire of a child of God. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. This is the desire. They wanted to learn about this truth so that they can help others. Is that not what happened to you when you became born again? Immediately you just discovered my mom, my dad, Hey, they are not born again. My brother, my sister, they are not born again. <clears throat> you know, when my wife became born again and wrote the mother about her experience, they thought she was depressed. They said, come home, come home, come home. They thought I was abusing her. I said, I'm not touch her more. I'm not touch her more. I'm not beat her more. She wrote them telling them about their, her experience. Oh, they said, this is, she must be mad now. You know, there are many people, when you tell them about Christ, eh? Eh? now you again, they come tell me about Jesus. In those days, they call it SU. You don't go join SU. Yay! He joined SU. Let me say, don't lost with that. But what they did not know is that they were the people who were lost. But this man who joined the SU, he just found life and is now living. Amen. The child of God wants, he wants to let others know. So this is the reason why they continued in the apostles' doctrine. They wanted to know more so that they can share With their parents. They can share with their sisters. Their eyes have been opened. So they wanted to share this very important knowledge with their relatives who were still living in darkness. The same Peter, writing in his first epistle, says in 1 Peter 3.15, Be ready always. 1 Peter 3.15 Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asked you a reason of the hope that is in you. If somebody says to me, why are you telling us about being born again? Then I will, I know the, I know the answer. I know what to tell them. I ask them, have you not stolen before? Eh, forget that matter. No. Have you not stolen before? Have you not committed fornication before? In fact, you are my brother. 
I know you have. I know you, I know your wife, and I know three other women that you are sleeping with. For the Bible says, the soul that sinned, he shall what? He shall die. God will punish you. I know it. If you have not sinned before, then this matter does not concern you. I am not talking of the one you did yesterday. I am talking of the one you did even 15 years ago. It's waiting for you. It, you have, it is not started bad. The Bible does not say because you sinned 20 years ago, okay, 20 years ago, God don't forget that word. No, God, don't, God has not forgotten. When you die, God will wake you up to come and give account of that sin that you committed 70 years ago. That's what the Apostle Peter is talking about. You have the reason. You know what to tell them. You see, Christians are men and women who know. They know. They know what they are. And they can tell others what they are. I know what I am in Christ Jesus. I know how Jesus saved me. How he took the punishment for my sin and set me free. And declared me righteous. There is another aspect of this matter that is important. What is this apostle's doctrine? The apostle's doctrine is what the apostles preached. And there is no other preaching in the New Testament apart from the apostles' doctrine. It's not what we are preaching today. I am not standing here to say what I think. I do not stand here to preach a new thing to you. I am simply repeating what I find in the gospel. I am repeating. You see that as since the past about one hour, I have been trying, I have limited myself to what I read to you in the Bible. I am repeating, I am expounding, I am explaining to you the apostles' doctrine. I am not preaching anything new to you. I am not saying to you my own. I'm not preaching to you psychology. I'm not calling the name of any dead writer or any dead author as we find in the Nigerian church. They preach some dead authors, dead psychologists, dead philosophers. They preach them. There is no preaching apart from the teaching of the apostles. The apostle Paul says, In Ephesians 2.20, he says the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. And in Hebrews 3.1, our Lord is described as the apostle and high priest of our profession. The first church in Jerusalem came together to listen to a particular teaching. They listened to a positive message given by the risen Lord to the apostles. What is the message? What is this teaching? What did the apostles teach? Do you know the apostolic teaching? You know, in this church we have been studying the book of Romans. Word for word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word for word, line by line, between the lines, between the lines. It is not psychology. It's not something vague or nebulous. It's something definite. It is not something 
that must change because we are living in the modern times not philosophy not the sciences it is the apostles doctrine the message is still the same there is no other message it is the same that is why the Pharisees, they got it wrong. When Jesus appeared on the scene, they thought that he was preaching another message. And what is this apostle's doctrine? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is it. But the fool will say, I know it. Tali, I know it. You don't know it. We know partly. We don't know it all. What is the apostle's doctrine? The apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 to 10. How ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. That is the apostles' doctrine. That is the apostolic teaching. You can never know it enough. It is deep and bottomless. Nobody knows it all. I've been preaching it and studying it for many years. And I still do not know it all. I am still grappling with it. It starts with God and it ends with God. The question is this. Are you continuing with the apostolic doctrine? That is it. Anytime you go into a church and you see the preaching is not in line with the apostolic doctrine, then you know that this church has deviated from the New Testament pattern. It is not even by miracles. Many times I am compelled to say I am not a healing evangelist. I am not sent to heal. It is true that while I am speaking, some people may be healed. But that is not my purpose. My purpose is to preach the word of God. My purpose is so that you can be born again. You will say, I am born again. My purpose, Father, is so that you can continue in that apostolic doctrine to know the height and the depth, the length and the breadth of the love of Christ towards us. So you can stand anywhere else and speak to the people that this is the word of God. Where is Lazarus today? Lazarus that Jesus himself healed. Lazarus come forth from the grave. Where is he today? He still died. But thank God that the preaching that Jesus made to Lazarus, he died with it. Amen, son. He died with it.